His Excellency Thomas Kufa, Management Committee members, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and a warm welcome to NUSS Meet the Ambassador Series. My name is Kai Seng from the NUSS Toastmasters Club and I'm delighted to bring you through this evening's session. It is our honour to have His Excellency Thomas Kupfer with us today to share with us on Switzerland, Singapore, what we can learn from each other. To start the evening proper, may I now invite Mr. Eddie Lee, NUSS President, to deliver his welcome address. Mr. Eddie Lee, sir. Good evening, His Excellency Thomas Koffer, Ambassador of Switzerland to Singapore, fellow NUSS members, friends and guests. A warm welcome and thank you for attending tonight's uh, NUSS Meet the Ambassador series. The Meet the Ambassador series was first introduced in 2009 with aims to forge closer ties between NUSS and the foreign community in Singapore providing members with a better understanding of local and foreign pers perspectives. It also provides a forum for ambassadors to share their insights on foreign policies and stimulate discussion on foreign relations and the global development. To date, His Excellency is the 14th foreign dignitary that NUSS had the privilege and pleasure of inviting to speak to members. Singapore and Switzerland may seem like two different countries, given their unique history and geographical distances. However, both are similar in many ways. Both Singapore and Switzerland have big neighbours, successful economies, and place high importance on good governance, higher education, as well as free trade. This evening may be, op be an opportunity time for us, the Ambassador, to share how it feels to be a small nation, and how maybe a small nation can behave. <laughs> so, and on a lighter note, two weeks ago, His Excellency wrote an article in the Sunday Times on travel in Ticino, if I pronounce correctly. And uh, apart from what you can insight, maybe you can give us some travel guides, tips to Switzerland. But more important, I think from today's topic is how both can learn from each other and build strong, lasting ties together. So I wish all of you an enjoyable evening tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eddie Lee. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Jeffrey Koo, NUSS Intellectual Pursuit Subcommittee Chairperson to introduce His Excellency Thomas Kupfer. Mr. Jeffrey Koo, please. Your Excellency, Ambassador Thomas Kufer, Switzerland, Ambassador to Singapore, welcome. And Grutzi, if I got it right, <laughs> Swiss German, in, uh, to say welcome, right? A little bit about the Ambassador. Ambassador Thomas Kufer has been the Ambassador of Switzerland to Singapore since September 2012. He was born in Zurich, Switzerland, in 1954, and is Swiss German. The ambassador completed his law studies at the University of Zurich in 1978 and obtained an attorney license for the Bar of Zurich in 1981. He joined the diplomatic service of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs in Bern, Switzerland in 1983. Since then, he has held different positions both in the headquarters and overseas, including a stint at the Swiss Embassy in Washington, a Swiss mission uh, to the European Union in Brussels in 1991, the Swiss Embassy in Rome, Italy in 95, Ambassador for Humita Humanitarian Affairs based in Geneva from 2000 to 2001, Ambassador to Colombia 2004 to 2008, and more recently, Ambassador to Korea from 2008 till 2012. He also served in positions <laughs> That's a lot, right? <laughs> As Deputy Director General of Africa and Middle East Division of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs from 2001 to 2003, and Secretary General of the International Conference of the Red Cross 
and Red Crescent in Geneva from 2003 to 2004. He's married to Mrs. Fiorella Kupfer Montiori, who I believe is Italian from what my friends tell me. Okay? From some of my mutual friends, I understand that the ambassador has a huge seller of wines and is also an avid golf player. With that, Ambassador Danke, right? <laughs> Thank you in Swiss German for coming to NUSS and we look forward to learning more from you about Switzerland this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Eddie Lee, moderator, Jeffrey, dear uh, guests, uh, participants, thank you very much to you take your time after a busy day to listen to me. I appreciate a lot. And um, I um, am really happy to be here in this uh, very prestigious university with the Alumni Association I'm already pleased that uh, the organizers decided to put uh, this nice photo of Zurich on the, on the invitation. So you can imagine this is my hometown, and I guess many of you have been there. I could speak a long about tourism to Switzerland. If you have some spare time, I will do it. But um, also there, we can learn from each other. But um, I would like to give you a little bit of an overview about Switzerland, Singapore, all the similarities, there's some differences, and really what we, <coughs> what we can learn from each other. <coughs> I'm sorry. I have some uh, PowerPoints here. I always think, can one not make a presentation without PowerPoints? But it just helps a little bit the memory, but I will speak uh, quite freely. And I really, really would like to have also afterwards some time for Q&A. I think this is very important. We start a little bit uh, in an easy way. So um, uh, you can imagine that this is a question you certainly have heard about. What, uh, what, to what did uh, uh, then the, uh, Prime Minister Go Chok Tong refer to when he was speaking on Switzerland in 1984? Please, hands up. Okay, uh, he said in 1984, Switzerland's goal, Singapore's goal is to accomplish a Swiss standard of living in 1999. So um, as you have uh, given the right answer, you are the happy receiver of this booklet. Um, uh, as, you, as you have seen, yes. As you have seen at uh, on the invitation, we celebrate this year 50 years Switzerland-Singapore diplomatic relation. This is uh, a little bit normal because you started your nation in uh, 65, so everybody celebrates with you last year, two years ago, or this year, next year, but it shows that we also have a long go. We produced uh, not a big book as uh, we have done in the past, but we produced a postcard book about uh, Swiss and Singaporeans' highlights over the last 50 years and today. Elements, visits, housing, things, what happened between the two countries. And uh, people are even invited to send this postcard then to um, a friend. But the ones who are now interested in the postcard booklet, you have a second chance. <laughs> Which country has been for a decade on the international index considered the best place for doing business. <laughs> Singapore? Singapore? Okay. Okay, also Switzerland didn't do too badly. Seventh place, Switzerland. Now, um, which is, according to international indexes, the most innovative country in 2017 and has been so for the last seven years? No! <laughs> Switzerland. Switzerland. 
And uh, Singapore is seventh here in this index. <laughs> Cannot always be the best. The index was done in Switzerland, so. Uh, now, this is um, perhaps um, uh, more uh, overall questions, and you can give many answers. What Swiss brands or Swiss personalities come into your mind? You don't, you don't get all a book on that, huh? but still, Rolex. Roger Federer, Swatch, Nestle, Tissot, yes. So you don't make too many publicity for all the brandings. What else? Sorry? Yes. Jungfrau Joch, yes, the Swiss Mountain. Toblerone, yes. UBS. Swiss so three, yes, uh, it's a company of our moderator. Okay. You see, here is a whole range. Um, obviously, we mentioned. Let's uh, let's start with the really uh, very uh, Swiss special ones: the, the cheese, the fondue, the chocolate, the Milo, Swiss product from Nestle, the Mountain, but then also Nespresso. You can say the banks, the watches. But then I would say also very important for us innovation. I mean, the very famous Swiss army knife, a classical innovation uh, uh, issue, but then also more modern robotics or uh, high tech instruments, innovation as in general. Okay, you rightly didn't say in a way ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, because I insist it's not Swiss, because it's an international institution, but it's very much linked to Switzerland. It has the, it has the, the Red Cross on the white spot, so the country, it was born in Switzerland, it's still in Switzerland, and Switzerland is very close to it, but it's a world organization where all the countries participate. And obviously King Roger in the middle, the most famous Swiss, it's a little bit funny when a sportsman is the most famous in the country, but uh, that's, uh, and here you didn't mention, this is our government. <coughs> True is, it is a government which I guess if they work very well, but they're not so well known by their names. Why? Because it's a collegial, oh sorry, it's a collegial government. They are seven plus one chancellor. So seven together form the government, it's collegial government. One of the seven is for one year the president in the more the, prim, um, the primus inter pares, and then he goes back to his ministry. So all of them, are kind of super ministers because they cover normally four, four or five topics in another country of the ministries. So in this year, we have a lady president, Madame Leutard, she's here. She's our minister also for environment, transport, and energy, and communication, and she's this year's president. But quite typically for Switzerland, you don't know the name of our politicians, it's a little bit a collegial system, but um, I guess it works quite well. So this is about the Swiss brandings and personalities. And my last questions on the, well, here you can get, can I have a little win? Who said that was first? Okay, please. So, so what is the most important gathering for both politicians and business leaders? Yes, it is the World Economic Forum in Davos, in the Swiss mountain, quite always in January. And uh, it has a lot of actuality because in three days it's, I'm coming back to NUS because not later than last Thursday, NUS conferred the honor, honoris, do, Dr. Kau, uh, honoris Doctorate to Professor Klaus Schwab here with the president when he got on last Thursday the, the doctorate for his uh, long time achievement and there's close relations between Singapore and the World Economic Forum. Okay. Now, just a quick overview on Switzerland, Singapore in the in a general way. On Singapore, I don't say tell you so much, you know better than me. But on Switzerland, a few information. I in, informed you already that um, we celebrate this year 50 years of bilateral relations, which is, uh, and we have re basically relations in all the different topics, which is normal between two countries, which are very friendly, which are very also, in many areas similar, even we are far apart geographically. So we have many political visits. Uh, last year we had a state visit here. We have um, 
our ministers coming here many times and vice versa, economic ties, strong academic ties, which also I'm very pleased. I mean, there is, NUS has ties into Swiss universities. The, the most famous Swiss university, ETH Zurich, it's a technical university of Zurich, the, the number one university of, uh, if non in, of the world, non-English speaking, tens in the ranking. They have close, they are here present in the Create Center and doing here research. But, and then, which also a lot of cultural exchanges, which I like a lot because that's really where people to people exchange. Um, we have here in Singapore a big Swiss community, about 5,000 people. It's, the, it's a big group and with about over 400 companies. Now, the many similarities, obviously, uh, I think it was mentioned already, the, 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 hist the history is, diff um, is different. All well, of this comes on the differences, but I can mention it here. The, 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 the history is different. You have, a, as a nation, a short history of 52 years now. We have a history which started, let's say, if we take it concretely, it's the, uh, uh, let's say, with all the myths, 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 myths which are in the history, it started in 1291, so 700, seven, six, 60 years ago. The real Switzerland, the modern Switzerland, started in 1848, which is also some time ago. You had a short history, and also um, the climate is a little bit different. Even in the moment, it's hotter in Switzerland than in Singapore. But more on the serious side, we have, sorry, we have uh, obviously a lot of parallelism in our structure of our country. In the sense, we have, you have four, let's say, three, four major ethnic groups, uh, which then corresponds often to the language, to the religion, and to the culture. In Switzerland, it's not necessarily different ethnic groups, but language groups and also religious groups. So this is quite similar, and we have similar compositionals in the, in the numbers of the different groups. We have in Switzerland the German-speaking, the French-speaking, the Italian-speaking, and the Romance-speaking. We have uh, both uh, small small territories. I mean, Singapore, indeed, a really small territory. Switzerland, a rather small territory. I come back to that when we talk about small states. Uh, and I would say rather small population, not that small either. We have, uh, we are both export oriented, free trade oriented. We have no natural resources in both countries. We have the water we use for energy, but that's it. Uh, and then uh, we have small domestic markets, so we use the, the whole world and the, the region and the whole world to do uh, uh, our business. Both countries are important uh, transport hubs, Singapore Air and Sea, and then the sea with the speciality that you are on the major world sea line, uh, shipping line uh, on the Malacca Street, a very uh, strategic place. Switzerland, we, are not, we have no sea but we have uh, a country in the middle of Europe. So the land is also, the land transport very important, north, south, east, west in Europe goes often through Switzerland. And obviously we have developed, you, sh you in the recent 20 years, we since 50 years, very strong financial centers. Now some differences, I mentioned already the, the, the history, but the most important difference is, is really the, the, the political setup. And uh, this makes really our two countries working the, quite differently. I mean, Switzerland, as you know, is a direct democracy with, with initiatives, referendum. We vote all the time on everything. This on three different levels, on the level of the confederation, on the level of the canton, on the level of the municipality. So um, uh, about four times a year we go to, vo to, to vote, not election, voting on issues and uh, normally about 10 different topics. So it's quite a lot of participation of the people. And we have this system of, uh, sorry, not so used here, on subsidiarity, subsidiarity, that means everything which can be done on a lower level, on municipality or canton is done there and not on the, on the federal level. So I would call it uh, a very strong bottom-up system, and it's probably the most bottom-up system in the world, and it works for us very fine, because we are used to it since, since, uh, since uh, centuries, I would say. Singapore is, in a way, the country. I mean, you are um, a city-state, so you have only one layer. You are, um, 
you call yourself or your leaders define yourselves as a meritocracy. So this is a, perhaps a specific definition for, of democratic system on doing a kind of a expressing the idea that who is successful and who is who is a, is qualified should lead the country should get up. I mean, still elected. So. Uh, you have, uh, it's not mentioned here, but you know this, you have a one-party system in not in de facto, in the sense that you have overruling one maj majority of one party and so on. So I would call your country uh, very much a top-down system, which works also very well, which is also uh, uh, has established itself a very good governance and this is the key for, for success. Now on the on the external front, I come back to this later, it's also a little bit uh, differences. You are uh, very strongly integrated in the region with ASEAN, the Southeast Asian Association, where you are a founding member. Singapore was always present there. And also in many other organizations, Singapore always looked for that. Switzerland, um, we are, uh, even we are in the heart of Europe, we are not a member of the European Union, so we are not having this Natural, natural trend to integrate ourselves politically, not economically, but politically with our neighbors. So I have uh, in the upcoming, uh, the, la the, the rest of the speech, four topics, four areas I want to focus on. One is uh, some of the foreign policy, education, and not so much university education, but more the vocational training, the professional education, immigration, foreign labor, and then digitalization, new technology, smart city. Now on foreign policy aspects, um, I mentioned already that Singapore is really uh, very strong in regional integration, ASEAN, uh, but also APEC and TPP. Okay, we are doing also a lot of free trade agreements, but every, every time when there is a a chance for Singapore to put yourself in a bigger group and motivate the group, bigger group doing integration, free trade and so on. Singapore is present and often a leader. And uh, this has been a policy over the, over the last 50 years, started by Lee Kuan Yew from the beginning. In Switzerland, you see just as a, a promemoria, you have here the map of Europe. We are really in the middle of Europe, now with Eastern Europe, a little bit less in the middle, but still. And uh, all around us is European Union. And we are very um, close to European Union. It's our natural partner, all the member, our neighbors, all the member countries. But deliberately, Switzerland has decided and uh, is still firm on this position to not join the European Union. Even we have many uh, agreements because Swiss people feel that they can, in the way they do, we do it ourselves, can be uh, better defend our interest and also um, uh, defend our some of our principles, being neutrality, being um, also the special form of federalism, uh, and also the direct democracy. So this is the reason why um, we have not joined the European Union, uh, even we are a very close partner. But I have to underline here on the trade area, Switzerland is exactly on the same line as Singapore. We are very much for free trade. Switzerland, Singapore, and Chile in South America, these are the three countries in the world which have the most free trade agreements because all three successful economies and all three countries which are uh, have small market and they want to have uh, 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 the possibility at the best conditions to compete on internationally. Now I come to this uh, uh, quite interesting topic of small states, which has become a hot issue in Singapore over the last uh, last two weeks. Uh, all my uh, kind of uh, kind of friends, uh, Singaporean friends, uh, the, the highly respected ex ambassadors or, st or still ambassadors at large, express themselves on this topic. Um, I don't want to get too much into the domestic discussion here, but it's quite interesting how, how Singapore or Singapore diplomatic leaders at, at, uh, touch this problem. Because um, Singapore always insisted for a long time that we are small, you are a small country and so on. So this is uh, basically everybody says so. 
Now the question is, is this really that much true? Are you such a small country? Is Switzerland such a small country? I mean, obviously, um, on size-wise territory, there is no doubt that Singapore is a small country. I checked on the ranking list, I think you're about 177, still about 40 countries smaller than you, so it's not the smallest, but it's small. I mean, I agree, because you're in the middle of huge countries and so on. Switzerland is also not big, it's 133 ranking in the, in the size, but we are much bigger than you, obviously, I mean, you can travel... Uh, but in five hours, you travel from the east to the west, and in five hours from the north to the south, it's also not that much, and even there's some mountains in between. Now, coming to more important factors, because territory size is not so important, population size. So, where is Singapore? Or s let me say first, where is Switzerland? Switzerland is, I checked this, is number 99 of about 200 plus countries. So, not really small. I mean, Compared to India and China and, um, and US, we are small, but there are 901 countries which are smaller than us in population. And where stands Singapore on population? 137. So still you have, no, sorry, um, sorry, sorry, 115, if I'm not mistaken. 115, but you can check uh, in the, in the Google if, you, if I'm right. It's not such a difference. You are 5.3 million, we are 8.5 million. So I would say we are both not that small countries. And we haven't talked about economic power, science, education, universities, um, standard of living, um, quality of life. And not by coincidence that our two countries are in many areas in the top ranking, because I took these two rankings a little at the beginning by chance, but you can have many rankings. And Switzerland and Singapore, fortunately, are always quite top. So we basically, in Switzerland, without being um, unmodest, when we got, uh, I remember a former foreign minister of mine, she was always uh, criticizing us ambassadors when we were talking about small countries. So she said, no, no, we are not such a small country. So have some confidence and do things. I think this is also true for Singapore. I understand the whole background about big countries and the red dot and 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 then. But Singapore has, is, is not uh, such a small country, has a very strong army, has a very strong uh, economy and um, in this sense, uh, I would say, uh, and, and, and Singapore plays quite well in the international field. You are a de facto member of G20, not all, not uh, full, f formally, but de facto. And uh, so uh, this is uh, my, how, how, how I see this. But there is no doubt that both of our countries, and there we are totally online, we always insist, um, there we go back to be a kind of a smaller country. There is, for us, the respect of the rule of law is very important. I mean, that's the only real weapon a small country has. I mean, we, we have also a relatively strong army. You have a quite strong army. But at the end, this, uh, in a real military situation, this helps uh, relatively. So we really can uh, uh, make uh, serve our own stability, uh, security and stability, but also the one in the region is contributing to the respect of the rule of the law, the international treaties, and uh, being active there to, to promote this. So I think there we are quite uh, online. So we come to the second topic. This is uh, the large topic of education, vocational training, future skills. As I said quickly before, um, on the high, high level of education, uh, NUS, NTU, the other SMU, the other universities in Switzerland, the ETH, the APFL in Lausanne, the many other universities we have uh, in the different cantons, there both countries are top and uh, really uh, um, um, uh, uh, excellent. But this is only a part of the importance of education. We have the the very low, the, the, the youngest kids, the education for small kids. I think there are both countries also quite, quite good. But where uh, perhaps there is a difference, I don't want to even qualify it in saying better or less, but why is it quite a big difference is the professional uh, vocational training system. In Switzerland, for the ones who know Switzerland well, this is the, one of the key of our, of our education system. 
Still today, more than 50% of our young kids from, let's say, when they finish mandatory school with 15 years old, they choose uh, in a very good way because they get advice, counseling and so on. They choose a profession which can be accountant, which can be electrician, which can be butcher, which can be bus driver, which can be all the simple and little more complicated ones. And they go then in a normally three or four year training, which is in a company, and they get uh, they the, pr the training on the job, very well accompanied by the professional association, and they get, uh, um, they get uh, uh, two, year, two days uh, school for general training and perhaps also in the, in the special area. Once they finish this uh, training, the apprenticeship at 19, they have a fully qualified profession, they can work and they are fit for the economy. Many of them today go further, they learn afterwards, uh, make new uh, uh, studies, they go afterwards to a university. For many it's not the end, but for some of them it's the end, but it's uh, not the uh, the, the, it's the end, which sometimes uh, it's uh, it's called uh, the Institute of Technical Education, which is also an, which is also an excellent uh, uh, institution. Now I don't have to explain you how it is in Singapore today. In the past, I learned that about 50 years ago, there was some kind of professional education in Singapore, also by Swiss and German companies. But then uh, the natural trend was everybody has to go to university. This is the only way to, be, to become happy. It's a little bit Confucius thinking. And uh, I was before ambassador in Korea, as it was said. There are 80% to a university degree and about 40% cannot use it afterwards. In Singapore, it's much better, but the government recognized over the last few years that this is a major challenge and um, they're looking for ways to apply some of our system or German system or, or other Dutch education system in the vocational training to bring it closer to the to the, um, to, the, to, the, to the to the reality, to the professional reality. Uh, Minister Ong Ye Kong, and obviously I cannot speak for him, but I think he was here in your uh, in your forum not so long ago. He went uh, several times already to Switzerland. He knows, and DPM Tarman also, they know our system best, and they are convinced that elements of our systems can be taken over in Singapore. You cannot copy paste it. Why not? There are two major challenges. Um, it needs the full support of the economy. The companies have to support the system because the, the, the young kids are trained in the, in the economy, uh, in the companies. And uh, uh, here is still the mentality, why should I train somebody? And then he goes to the other company and what's the advantage for me? So this is a, a, a quite a long-term process. And perhaps even more complicated is the change of mind set of the parents, of the children and the society as such that uh, a good uh, handyman, a good uh, electrician, a good uh, seller in a, a, a nurse in a hospital is as much valid than some of us who have uh, PhDs. So this, I guess, is an area, and I all the time hear this from the Singaporean uh, friends, that they want to look more into the Swiss system and see what's, what could you learn from Switzerland there. Now I come to a totally different, not totally a related topic, it's uh, immigration and foreign labor. <clears throat> Both of our countries uh, uh, have seen over the many years a big increase of foreign population. Why? Because we were successful countries and people wanted to come to work here or there in Switzerland and the companies needed these foreign workers being on the higher level uh, Singapore was very active in the beginning when you brought in the foreign companies to bring also foreign high labor to, to, to run these companies and your people were not yet so much ready. But also on the lower uh, lower field of the, of the ranking, um, there was a lot of needed for foreign laborers. I mean, you see in Singapore, all the construction workers, the, the, the maids in the, in the houses, these all foreigners. This was very similar in Switzerland 50, 60 years ago. It, it has changed quite a lot in Switzerland and we have still a high population of foreigners, but uh, they have integrated much more in our country. So both of our governments know that we need the foreign uh, workforce for making our economy going, but both of our populations, uh, said it a little bit simplified, I have a little bit the feeling there are too many foreigners there, they can potentially take away the jobs, 
They make the housing more expensive, they make the highways more full, and so on. So this is a challenge for both of our countries. For Switzerland, um, the challenge is even bigger because we have a, we are quite we are very strongly related to the European Union, even if we are not member. We have free circulation of person. We call this so basically a German or a Spanish or a, a, a Swede. He can come to work in Switzerland when he has a job. He gets automatically the, the permit. That's a European Union system. Uh, our people can also go to these countries. But so it's very difficult to, to control this in a more tighter way as some Swiss people wanted. We had a vote on that two years ago and it complicated very much our system. Singapore doesn't have this, uh, this, this, this challenge because you don't have, ASEAN has no free circulation of person, also no Schengen, and it won't come because uh, this idea has uh, been rejected now because they have seen some of the difficulties, also many advantages in Europe. Plus, as I said before, you have with your top-down system of the government can more easily also manage the whole labor system. This company gets so much quota, this sector so much. So it's a very micromanagement and it's working because it has become more difficult for foreigners also on a higher level of education to get jobs here in Singapore. It's not impossible, it just has become more complicated, which is a wish probably from the Singaporean population. Now, a topic which is not, uh, which in Europe is a very big topic, and also in this um, immigration part is the issue of refugees. Uh, it's one of the biggest challenges in Europe. Uh, you have seen two years ago, one million uh, people, refugees uh, to Germany, but also in Switzerland, traditionally we have a high number of refugees. That's a, and uh, also we had many uh, in the history, very high qualified uh, refugees who brought ahead our economy, our culture, our academia in the 19th century. Now today we have uh, still high numbers of refugees uh, and we still take them uh, population often is a little bit uh, not so happy about it, but it's part of our, uh, the, the government feels that it's our responsibility. Plus, we often have no choice because they're just here. We don't invite them, they're just here. And then it doesn't matter at the end to say if it's a political refugee or an economic refugee, which basically after the, 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 the international convention, only a political refugee has the right for for asylum, but if somebody's in the country and says, I'm here, it's quite difficult sometimes to send it back. In Singapore, we know there is basically no refugees. The government, and I feel also a little bit the population, is of the opinion that this is uh, better so. One could discuss this perhaps later. And now the fourth uh, uh, sector is, uh, let's say, a little bit uh, mixed, but I just think in areas like uh, digitalization, uh, new technologies, fintech, smart city, all these modern topics of, of development of our society, cyber uh, topics, cyber security, for example, where Singapore was just uh, got a number one ranking recently. These are all topics which obviously for both of our countries are central and very important. Um, Singapore uh, handles these issues very well uh, because uh, it helps also this top-down government approach that Topics are identified and then often with uh, strong government support, with uh, assistance perhaps uh, by the private sector or semi-private sector, are then put into reality. So um, let's take the issue, for example, of fintech, uh, which for financial centers are very important. Singapore uh, identified this topic put a lot of uh, emphasis on it, made uh, with government assistance, fintech festival, invited fintech companies, and has itself through this established already as a kind of a fintech hub in Asia. So it's a lot of uh, joint activities between government, led by government, and then the private sector in these new sectors. Smart city is an area where also Singapore is very well advanced. Switzerland, I would say, is on the technical side also advanced in these areas, uh, and uh, we are doing quite well. But um, our approach from the government is a little bit different, I think, and probably even we look at the Singapore system, we probably stick to our approach. 
we, 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 we do only the, the framework from the government side. We identify the issues, we give uh, some perhaps a law. We have, for example, now done a new fintech law where we give the possibility for easier access for fintech companies where they don't have so much money yet, starts up to establish themselves different than a bank. But we don't organize it then for them. We don't give them the money. So it's basically just putting the framework. So government is much more uh, uh, in, 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 uh, behind in Switzerland. And that's a generally the Swiss approach, which uh, is in a way different than the Singaporean approach. Obviously important in both ways, it is that, uh, that um, uh, we, we, are, we, are, uh, we are capable in these areas. We are moving ahead. We are leaders in these new challenges. Now, perhaps here, and I come to the conclusion, um, an overview of some of the challenges for both of our countries, perhaps sometimes a little bit on a, on a different uh, angle. Innovation is, as I said it before, is really a key factor for our economic development. I would say we, do, we both countries do quite well there, and, uh, but it's a continuous struggle. It was interesting, your recent report by your government on the future economy, which comes out every few years. And there I noticed also comparing to the old reports, it has changed a lot because in the past, Singapore was often referring, yes, we should do a little bit like Switzerland or Germany or the US or uh, Hong Kong in some area, I don't know, or Japan in the past. Now you have advanced in so many areas that well, which is a good thing that you cannot just refer to others anymore. You have m many areas, you have to, you have become a, a leader. Demography and Im immigration, I have mentioned, which we are ahead, both of our countries, of this huge challenge of a changing demogra demography. Still today, there is uh, in Singapore, um, um, a a relative, the, the, the ratio between old and young is still in Singapore a little bit better than in Switzerland, but in 2030, it will be the same. So uh, this will be quite critical for our countries, who pays the, for the elderly people, who takes care of them, and so on. And uh, not really solution in sight for that, even if Prime Minister makes all these strong appeals of uh, the young people to make babies, but uh, not sure if this really works that well. In Switzerland, such an appeal would not be uh, possible. Ensure employment and continue providing work opportunities for the youth. This obviously um, is very important. And I think in our two countries, we still have to be aware of that, even we're doing very well on this. Because, you know, uh, in other countries in Asia, which are perhaps not so much developed, but Korea is a developed country, they have quite a strong youth unemployment. And Korea is a highly developed country. In Europe, we have many highly uh, developed countries, particularly in the southern part of Europe, who have huge youth un unemployment, which is a major problem. And I think we have to make sure, both of our countries, that we keep this as it is now, make sure that we find young people, when they finish their education, find jobs, perhaps, um, the vocational training can be a further element also in Singapore for the future to assure this, also increase productivity. Because I, we are convinced that our system of vocational training helps a lot also to have a high productivity. This concludes in a way in maintain and improve quality of living in a general way. I think there Singapore has changed a lot over the last 15 years. It's not only quantitative uh, in, uh, economic growth, but also quality. Uh, good environment, uh, parks, uh, places for bicycles, uh, um, culture, uh, also having possibility to vacation, and so on. So there, I think Singapore has, has developed quite strongly over the last few years because population feels we work hard, we gain good money, but we want also enjoy life. All this um, very, in a very serious uh, Asian way, obviously. And then perhaps my last point is, I think this is a challenge, but it's also a must. I mean, both of our countries, which are so uh, successful, as we have mentioned now, have to make sure that we, in our own way, contribute to peace, stability, and economic growth, first in our regions, obviously, but in a way where we can also worldwide. And, uh, um, there, each country decides how it does it best. I'm convinced there, Singapore has there still a lot of potential to do more. 
uh, it's a little bit connected to the small state approach. We are so small, we cannot do things. I think Singapore does already today good things uh, outside of Singapore, but has even more potential. Let's take the example, for example, for climate change, a big issue. I mean, um, uh, and this uh, will remain a problem despite the US uh, president's position. But climate change, Singapore, for example, could be more go ahead as a modern country, as a technology uh, related country, and give a, be an example for the, for the neighboring countries and, uh, and uh, in a way a model. So my conclusion, Switzerland uh, has, uh, may have been really in the past, uh, and we are proud of that, a role model or inspiration for Singapore. Uh, it was not only Go Chok Tong said so, uh, I mean, he when when he then uh, for finishing the story there, he said this. Uh, he set the goal in '84, living uh, similar living standards. That in '94 he came to the conclusion that it has been achieved, five years ahead, because the statistics were there. Some people in Singapore, I read uh, in books and so, were uh, putting this a little bit into questions because uh, living standard is not only questions of statistics, but anyway. It, it, we were, we have been for Singapore an inspiration, also in our military uh, system. I didn't mention this too much here, but Switzerland, Singapore, uh, man, um, compulsory military system was built after the Swiss model. But later, you looked more to other countries which were more active in military, like Israel. So in the past, certainly yes, we were model. In today, I think we are, can learn really on both sides. I, I think I have given many examples of that. It's not in one side anymore. There are areas where Singapore has developed strongly and uh, perhaps through its more slim and easy government system, top-down system has developed faster than us. So you can uh, give us some uh, hints and ideas and in other areas, I think still Switzerland has some, uh, has some good uh, traditional grounds. Um, so um, in this sense, uh, that that's also explains why there are so many exchanges between our ministries. There's not that much cooperation because true is we are quite far apart. But in many of the modern areas, we are, we are going just in parallel and we want to know what you are doing and you want to know what we are doing. And then we can be inspired to each other. So with this, I would like to conclude my uh, little presentation and uh, ask you for some uh, challenging questions, like in the parliament. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency Thomas Kupfer, for sharing with us your views. I'm sure many of you are burning with questions. To facilitate the next part of the program, we want to invite Mr. Jeffrey Ku to moderate the question and answer session. Mr. Ku. Okay, good evening everyone. As usual, we'll start with the house rules. I think those that have uh, come for a number of these dialogues will probably memorize what they are, but I'm going to repeat them. Um, the first of which is uh, please switch off uh, or turn your handphones to vibration mode or silent mode so that you will not uh, disrupt uh, the, the session. Uh, secondly, um, if you have a question, please come up to the mic. Uh, ask uh, and ask a question and, 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 not, uh, and limit that to a minute. Uh, if you have a comment, also please keep it short so we can actually have more questions that, uh, that will come during this session, right? Thank you. Please. Hello. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for your sharing of insights. I'm Chong Ki Chung, NUSS member. Um, what are some of the brand names or services that uh, in the sharing and experiential economy that Switzerland has that we can be our role model? That's first. Second, we learned that the Swiss government uh, decision-making process is made by a team of seven members. How is the selection process of these seven members mm -hmm. and how are they making decisions for major issue? Are they vote for major decision and the decision um, or, and their voting um, is transparent to citizen? Last, 
Um, Switzerland is a neutral country. Um, Singapore is also a neutral country, but sometimes we probably make some statement that invite some criticism. What is your advice of your public statement policy? Do you um, no, keep silence for most of the uh, uh, issue that you have no influence on, or you 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 are doing what likewise Singapore doing? You you got the last question clear? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to the can you hear me? To the to the first questions about the Swiss companies. Um, we are lucky in Switzerland, and I, you have seen some of the brandings there, could be the whole page full of. We are lucky in Switzerland, we have uh, a, a very long historical presence of uh, multinational companies of worldwide standards, like the, the banks, uh, like the pharma companies, like the ABB, like the Nestle, and so on. So these are all these companies are uh, worldwide present. They are today global companies, but they have still their home base in Switzerland, and sometimes even though it's glo think globally, they have still a, a, a Swiss-based approach on some of the issues. For example, uh, on the money uh, spending and so on, where you never spend more than you have, and so these kind of things. But it's not only the big companies which are important, there's also the medium-sized and small companies in Switzerland, which are often not so well known by name, and which make uh, really the bulk, of, uh, the bulk of, the, of the Swiss economy. Uh, and they are not only in Switzerland, they're really internationally present. They always, always in the export. And uh, they are, uh, the mid-sized companies often also in Asia are present, uh, often in Singapore for, uh, for ASEAN or Asia Pacific. And they are um, doing, doing quite well. They, they have uh, often quite uh, slim procedure, slim uh, management. They sometimes uh, have uh, the smaller companies have niche products in high technology, in uh, life science and so on and i think switzerland has also is lucky we have i think the highest numbers of patents by whatever company or by population uh, in switzerland so many of them are quite also innovative so i think the small and medium size uh, fact is is, is 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 very important and uh, helps us a lot and it's very much linked to the vocational training system which uh, you see, in Switzerland, uh, a young man or young woman, a girl, when she finishes her studies or vocational training, there's not always this huge drive to go to only to the big company. Like uh, you have to go in, in Korea, you have to go to Samsung, then you, you become a happy family. And beside, beside hap Samsung, there's not much. But in Switzerland, it's very different. So the people go to big companies like Swiss Re perhaps, but they go also to small companies and uh, have a very good career ahead. Now your second point about very differently about the government. Um, I didn't want you to go in all the details about our Swiss political system. Besides the, the cantons and the federalism, our system is very close uh, to the US system of two chambers. We have a House of Representatives, the, which is uh, like the House of yeah, like in the US, and then we have a Senate like in the US. Um, together they are the, the parliament. It's a not a, it's like Singapore, not a full time uh, full time parliament. They are all have their jobs and meet uh, a little bit more often than here, but um, they have uh, still very close to the economy. This parliament uh, elects the government, so we elect the government not by the population directly, but indirectly through parliament. Uh, but it represents always the different parties in the government, in the parliament, and, in, and it's a tradition in Switzerland, not a law, that the major parties in the, in our rep in the parliament represent then also the government, and it's very stable. So they elect every, uh, are elected every four years. Um, as I said, within the government, we have uh, one who is the, the chair, he signs the bills, and he chairs the meetings, and he represents a little bit more towards the outside, but he's only one of the seven. And then uh, one year, he goes back to his original work. Mm -hmm. This works relatively well for us. Um, it's sometimes a little bit uh, perhaps slow. It's uh, quite transparent, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it's quite transparent. That's, um, yeah. And, um, and it's, uh, as I said, a collective government, which but then you see the, the special thing in Switzerland, even the government has decided something with 
after it goes to the parliament, the parliament approves, that happens in all the countries, but afterwards in many, many cases, not in all cases, we have to go in front of the people and ask the people, do you agree with that, do you disagree? Sometimes people have to collect signatures to do that, or sometimes it's automatically, it depends on the topic, but this is quite a slowing down process, but at the end, when people have decided, then it's quite strongly anchored in the population and people are feel feel, particip uh, feel um, included. And I give you an example. I mean, what other country, perhaps Singapore, I don't know, could be, I'm not sure. What other country would, um, would uh, in a popular vote, would say, no, we don't want to have six weeks of vacation, four weeks for everybody is enough. The trade union some years ago made an initiative that everybody should have six weeks of vacation. And the population said, no, four weeks is better for the system, for our system. So people are quite mature in political thinking because they're used on that. Now your third issue about the, the mutuality and so on. I mean, Switzerland is really still a, a neutral country. Uh, we are one of the few remaining neutral countries because in Europe also former neutral countries like Sweden or Austria have moved towards a much more non-neutral uh, policy, which is not a question of qualification. I don't say neutral is better than non-neutral, it's just different. Uh, because these countries uh, would like or, or considering to joining in NATO, and when you're in the NATO, you cannot be neutral. Um, you can be neutral in the European Union because it's not really on that, but already they are sometimes a little bit more complicated. I would not consider Singapore a neutral country because you're not uh, militarily and so on, you have uh, made some kind of quite strong uh, alliances, uh, all historic alliances, with, uh, still from the time from the British, uh, uh, with, uh, with the five, uh, five uh, states uh, pact, uh, within, uh, with also a strong alliance with, uh, with the US. Uh, so this is not neutrality in the sense of the international law. But Singapore has always tried to stay a little bit in between and very successfully, and particularly very successfully, uh, let's say, first already in the region through ASEAN and with your big two neighbors, Malaysia and Indonesia, which was in the past a complicated relation, which has, is today a very good relation, but always with the potential of a conflict. Even I'm optimistic that this works quite fine. But in the middle, I would say very good, uh, between the two today's two today's big superpowers, the China and the U.S. I mean, obviously, you have very different relations with both countries, uh, but uh, your relations with the U.S. is a military, strategic one, also a political one, very close. Uh, with China, it's a beside a historical one, which is not in the center for you, but but for China sometimes. But it's an economic, very strong relations and. China, uh, Singapore managed very well to have excellent relations with the two superpowers. And I think this, uh, I, this thing will, I think, continue. Even these little uh, frictions you had recently, perhaps with China, I think this is uh, more an imp uh, a reflection of the general showing of muscles by China all over in South China Sea, in Asia, and in the world. And you're also not exempted from that, obviously. But uh, this doesn't mean that uh, they, 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 so I don't see this as a major problem. So I think uh, Singapore does this very well, this uh, uh, having a, a, a policy in between. But I would sometimes think uh, you could, uh, not in the very big policy, but in other areas, even sometimes be more advancing things. I think, for example, if Singapore was very successful, Singapore, when you could host the uh, the summit between Taiwan and, uh, and um, China three years ago. And this doesn't come for, from anything. This is a result of a long uh, policy of helping between the two countries and trying to have an uh, un unbinded uh, position, I would say. Right. Thank you. <coughs> My name is uh, Justin Kwan, and I'm uh, an NUSS member. The question I'd like to ask, ask you, sir, is, uh, is regarding about the issue on immigration. Sir, do you personally foresee any uh, problems and, uh, and, control and controversies reg regarding any uh, 
as the issue on Switzerland's own immigration, especially in light of uh, Brexit as well as the uh, election of uh, Donald Trump in the United States? Yes, thank, thank you for this question. Uh, it is really a big issue in Switzerland, the immigration issue, as in all uh, European countries. Mm, I didn't mention before, we have in Switzerland the second highest level of foreigners in Europe. Luxembourg, a small country with 300,000 population, they have a, a higher percentage. But if not, is Switzerland the highest? With 25% of the working population is non-Swiss, still Singapore even a little bit higher. But uh, for Switzerland, this is, for Europe, this is very high. And as I said, we, we, we need uh, the population, uh, we need this population, uh, they are part of our, of our economic system and also about, today also part of our cultural and society. Now, um, I wouldn't say Brexit and the US election have, uh, have uh, any impact on, on the issue of the immigration in Switzerland, but it is a challenge. We have to reconfirm re, uh, our um, foreign labor relations with the European Union. As I mentioned before, this is a challenge. We, we will manage to do that, but we have, um, We will, we will also uh, try probably to make sure that also in Switzerland the numbers of foreigners don't get higher. We won't be able to decrease them a lot, but keep them stable at the 20% of today of population and 25% of the working population. This should be more or less the, 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 the figures. We have uh, a lot of Swiss also working in outside of Switzerland. We have of 8 million Swiss population in Switzerland, not Swiss, but population in Switzerland, we have about 800,000, so 10% who live abroad. 5,000 here in Singapore. And so these also are uh, results of the glo globalization, of the exchanges, people go study abroad, go work abroad, marry, um, marry uh, in, uh, in with different uh, uh, citizens. We have in Switzerland a huge number of citizens from different countries which marry to each other. Even in our foreign diplomatic service, I noticed. So this is a very much uh, we also part of this multicultural society, which is, if you like it or not, it's just part of the of the of the, of the world today. Just a, just a comment also on uh, on a consensus based kind of government. Singapore does also have a, a rich feedback unit where actually they would. Uh, ask for public opinion over certain matters also. So in, the, in that sense, we're also developing. And we also do have at a grassroots level what we call the meet the people session that some of us are involved in. And then you also get feedback. But in, in terms of voting on a particular issue, that, that has not really happened in that sense. But hopefully in the future, we will develop into that level. Yeah, next question. Good evening, His Excellency. <clears throat> My name is Charlie So. I'm a member of the NUSS Society. Uh, my first question is that uh, uh, Switzerland is the financial center and well known for their private banking in Europe and the world. So can you share with us or give us some updates that given the uh, fintech and disruptive technology, how has uh, Switzerland uh, evolved and improved on their financial banking system? And how, uh, how, how can Singapore you know, share or learn from each other? That's the first question. And the second question is on the one MDB case, whereby Singapore, Switzerland, and Malaysia were involved. Perhaps you can share with us what, what is the real story and what is the latest update. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Concerning generally the financial system of Switzerland and Singapore, as I said, you also repeated it, we are both financial centers. And I would stress at the beginning, we are mostly complementary and we are not competitors. Because Singapore strongly developed over the last uh, 20 years, but it's mostly an Asian financial center. Switzerland is a European or a global financial center still. So I think we are, and I see when I talk to our bankers, it's not really uh, or Singapore or Switzerland, uh, both have a space that your competitor is Hong Kong and ours perhaps London, but London is much bigger even than Switzerland. Switzerland has um, uh, the strongest part of Swiss banking is the, the private banking, you're right. Our two biggest banks are top uh, in there, top three, and uh, we have many other private banks in other banks in Switzerland who are strong in private banking. 
we have also investment banking, but not as much. Switzer, but this st strong position in private banking uh, created us over the years also some difficulties. You may have noticed that um, the world has changed a lot. Uh, the idea today, while well, for tw 10 years ago, a Swiss banker or even a Swiss politician, and also Singapore in exactly the same, could say, but this is not our problem. If they don't pay the taxes somewhere, you have to look for your own citizen. This has not this is, has not possible anymore to be today, because uh, countries have um, have uh, financial problems. Countries want rightly that people pay the taxes in their countries, and so the whole discussion of the tax uh, tax exchange information of uh, automatic exchange information has uh, changed completely the. The, the whole system and we were uh, our banks had for many years to adapt on it we took a more longer time to adapt it Singapore with the top-down strategic approach could do, could do this much quicker and in a less painful way but both of our countries and both of our banks were not so excited about it but we have adjusted so I think this is history it's, it's now gone Switzerland ha has again developed a new strong financial center and uh, our banks still are very competitive. We have also looked into the new technologies, as you we say before, fintech, for example, is, is, a, is, a, is a new uh, chance. So, uh, and uh, I think uh, the whole financial sector has become much more automatized, digitalized, and IT has become crucial. So I think, our, as I understand, our, our financial center is there. And by the fact that uh, big banks like UBS, Credit Suisse, Bank Julius Baer and others are here in Singapore, work daily with MIS and the uh, and finance ministry. So automatically there is a steady daily exchange between their Swiss uh, thinking or Singaporean thinking. And I think this is uh, on the advantage, on the advantage of both of them. Um, so. I'm quite optimistic there that this will, uh, will, will continue so. On the one MDB, uh, I will tell you now the full story. Take note. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I would say in the mentioning of who was involved, I would say first Malaysia, and then uh, others, but it's, well, it's a Malaysian scandal or problem and uh, perhaps even more focused on some uh, important people there. Um, but obviously, as all this in such uh, uh, corruption schemes or um, mishandling of public or private fund schemes, immediately many, many banks and many countries are involved. And it was logical that Singapore, as very close to Malaysia, was directly involved. The Singapore banks in Singapore and also afterwards banks in Switzerland, and banks in Dubai, this was a direct uh, line, and then also later in the United States. So it was quite a big thing. And um, what I can say is that uh, I cannot comment so much, uh, it's not up to me what, what, what uh, the, the people in charge of the fund did, but I think the Swiss, uh, and the Singaporean authorities worked very closely together, together then also with the U.S. and I guess also with the partly with the with the Emirates, but particularly Singapore, Switzerland, and U.S. to bring uh, things to the light, to find out what's happening, to institute the money, uh, find out where these huge sums went, cooperation between uh, MIS and uh, Tony. General, General Chambers and the Swiss respective authorities was very close and worked well. It was for Singapore uh, even more difficult thing than for Switzerland because your neighbor of Malaysia, you have very close political relations. So Switzerland, we are friends of Malaysia in general, but you don't know, for us it was less difficult. So I think Singapore needed sometimes also a little bit of push by, uh, by, by us or by the US to move, but at the end, uh, I think things came more or less to the light. At the end, there were um, almost every bank here in Singapore, not every, but almost every bank was involved in one or the other way. Some banks, and these were in this case two Swiss-based banks, smaller banks were touched the most. Perhaps they did the most badly, I don't know, that's difficult to say. Sometimes it's easier 
to hit a small one than a big one. But um, anyway, this has happened, and I think uh, it's more or less, I think the investigation and so on are relatively advanced or relatively closed. And it was a good example for good international cooperation between uh, the major financial centers. And uh, it shows also that countries like Singapore, Switzerland, want to be in the, as much as transparent and clean financial center as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for that enriching talk. Um, we are glad, very glad that we have reached your Swiss standard of living. Sometimes I wish we have the Swiss weather as well. <laughs> anyway, my question is this. How does your country develop political, political consciousness among its people, especially the young? And what part has the education system and media play? Perhaps there are other factors as well. Thank you. So you, you're referring to political consciousness. How, how yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is certainly a challenge for all countries today in the world. Uh, uh, perhaps the, uh, I would say generally the Swiss political system uh, is quite um, good for making people interested in politics because everybody can really participate all the time. Not that everybody's always happy when you vote and you lose and you're often unhappy, but still you recognize that you have a, could have a saying. And we are lucky also in Switzerland through these three levels approach, confederation, um, canton, which is a state in the US, or a city, municipality. Particularly on the lower level, it's very close to the people. It's a bit like in Singapore, in the neighborhood, or in the, in the, in the, in the people's association, and so on. Even these are not politically, uh, not political entities, but still they helping to, to make a good living. But you see, when in Switzerland, when you have the possibility to vote in a city, do we want this new school or not? Or are you agree that the taxes have to be raised to 2%? Then people are involved. And even if they lose perhaps the elections, they feel they have participated. So generally, this helps us to be politically active and politically conscious. And I feel uh, uh, perhaps a little bit more than here in Singapore. Now the young people uh, have the, it is a challenge today that uh, uh, you have many other interests. Information is ready everywhere. In the, in the uh, so so is it is perhaps uh, has become a little bit more difficult to to get the young people interested and active in the politics. We try and our parties try to do this, but it's a struggle that also young people are elected in the entities. Young people can come to government uh, to local and canton governments. Even on the federal government, we have of the seven, I think, I think three of them are in the, two are in the 40s, I think two in the 50s, and perhaps three in the 60s, so it's not really old. Uh, we, we change also, for example, we, we, we go into elec electronic voting, electronic elections, uh, so this makes uh, also for young people a little bit more attractive. So these are some, some of, the, of the things, but uh, it is a challenge, and. Uh, People, uh, politic, policy has to remain credible. People have to feel that that uh, it makes sense to be interested into politics and to challenge the leaders. And um, and you have uh, it's not only it was now by chance now in Germany you have seen the G20 uh, this uh, big uh, big uh, big meetings, but then also these huge uh, demonstrations, which 95 percent was totally peaceful, which we totally support. There were even people from Switzerland traveling there to protest against for climate change, uh, so for take care of climate change, or for this or that, or against globalization. But then there were thousands of these young uh, people who were just there for doing violence. They're just criminals, and they really went there with the only objective to, to be violent. And the government, which uh, had not the, the German government, they made huge efforts, but they could not control it. Then at the end, this is then what comes out as also almost the main result of the G20, which is unfortunate. Not that the G20 this time was a huge success, but I mean, still leaders talk together and try to advance things. Then uh, for the population, say, what, what's the use of all of it? It's, um, it's a challenge. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you for the answer. Ambassador, maybe I ask a question. You know, I, I mean, I was, uh, I, I mean, I went to Zurich the first time two years ago, and the first thing that struck me was this, is that when you take a train, you click your card outside, and you just go in. Nobody checks you. There's no gantry. There's no nothing of that nature, right? So I was wondering that if you have the same system in another country, somewhere in Asia, you probably might go bankrupt. So the question is, where does this kind of culture come, this honesty, you know, in terms of, you know, using the public transport, for example? Um, yeah, it's a little bit uh, uh, for education. It's not as idyllic as you say, because uh, uh, some people, and I have to admit, it happened also to me once when I was very young, try once also to go without paying. Uh, then you take the risk that you pay quite a high fine. I mean, it's about... Uh, I think you get uh, the transport ticket, I think, costs, um, let's say it's quite expensive, let's say two francs or three francs according to where you're going. And uh, when you catch, when they catch you without the ticket, a valid ticket, you pay, I think, uh, 20 francs for the ticket, which is not so much, and then 100 francs for the special administration work. So you think the second time if you want to do it again. There is some control. But uh, it's a little bit the questions of mixing, giving the people of uh, some 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 responsibility. And sometimes not everybody can take take live up to it all the time. Also, perhaps reduce the administrative costs of of the of the system. So it's a little bit a mix. But it's not uh, not everybody also in Switzerland is a daily hero. So don't uh, yeah. think so. Thank you for letting me know the price of the fine. The next time yeah, I will really big, remember. To yeah, it's big. <laughs> it's big written there. And now they have, I saw the other day, I had a very good ticket, so no danger. Uh, they came in on three doors in the same time, so no chance to escape. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yvonne Tan from NUSS Toastmasters Club. Um, I'd just like to build on the lady's question earlier, and uh, this is in relation to the bottom-up approach that you shared. I think for many of us Singaporeans, top-down is a no-brainer. We are very familiar with that concept. But um, bottom up uh, is something that we are not entirely familiar. Um, rather than the earlier question around how did the Swiss people get around that culture, very curious with your time about almost five years now in Singapore, um, along with what you shared on your observations of what work in Singapore, top down, that has worked, any, any reflections from your, you know, um, being here for about five years on what opportunities of bottom-up that Singaporean people or the government can start looking into and explore and visualize what good look like for us because honestly I think most of us are clueless that's part one of my question um, second part if I may is um, as as the world globalized earlier you mentioned there are a lot of cross-cultural cross-national marriages and Swiss is a lot more open how has Switzerland been able to um, preserve that bottom-up culture? Very curious how you defend you know, that identity. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting question. Um, concerning the, the bottom-up, it has really, uh, we have learned this since, really since centuries. And really there we go back to 1291 and even further, when at that time uh, in the mountain, uh, let's say in Swiss, where you know Switzerland well, near Lucerne or where they're the heart of Switzerland. And the farmers, there were rebellions against the Habsburgian. Uh, this happens in all the countries, but then there was quite quickly established this kind of uh, joint decision-making on the, on the grassroots, the people get together and uh, 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 to, uh, and were quite, there was always quite a lot of rejection in Switzerland against the uh, uh, a strong leader, a one person who decides everything for everybody. So there was always a little bit this tradition of uh, the locals to get together, and uh, at that time, unfortunately, only the men. Uh, fortunately, later, later also very importantly, also the women came into the, quite late. I have to admit, came into the political uh, decision making. So this has a very really long tradition, and then. It, and still, for example, you know, we have in um, in uh, many, not many, now only two cantons left. Before there were about 10 of them, because population has grown, so it's more difficult. But still in these cantons, we have the Lanz, Landsgemeinde. It's a community of the people. So that means once, normally once or twice a year, all the people who are allowed to vote meet on the big square in the, in, in the, in the capital of this, uh, of this canton. And 
decide in one half a day all important political matters. Voting like this can be, we can say it's not so democratic because you see if you yes or no, but this is a kind of a basic democratic um, proceeding to do, like we do sometimes perhaps in a family, who is in favor, who is against, and so on. So we do this uh, in a way on this more bigger front. And it's a long time, it's a long tradition which cannot work easily or not at all in other countries. So that's very unique, Swiss, and uh, it has to be a relatively small country, so then small canton or municipality, but it works fine. Now, um, uh, on Singapore, um, on, on, uh, uh, and, and as I said before, that's also important with the, with the vote, initiative, referendum. You win, you lose, but you accept the result and you don't put, put into question. And then uh, you try, perhaps the left tries again, make an initiative, that the right wins. We have, not everybody's of the same opinion. We have, like all the countries, we have the left, the center, the more right, we have the younger people, the elderly people, the country people against the city, or with the city people. The city people are more modern, modern oriented. The, the country people are often a bit more conservative. We have, so the young, the elderly, and so on. Now concerning Singapore, um, sometimes as a joke, or as, a, as a joking suggestions, I made this proposal in private to some ministers to say, why don't they introduce this uh, referendum and initiative? But the enthusiasm was uh, limited. <laughs> it would not work here. And this is not uh, also the objective for Singapore. I think Singapore has its own way, which works well for you. Um, I would sometimes think uh, uh, Singaporean citizen has become also very mature over the years and uh, could eventually be sometimes uh, 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 more trusted in taking their decisions. I don't believe generally in too much that, sh that the government has to tell the citizen what he has to do or what he has not to do, particularly when there is uh, moral or uh, civic issues and political thinking. Obviously, the government has to give the guidance and uh, make it to that the law is respected and so on. So I would say sometimes in Singapore, this could be uh, eventually, and I think it happens, that more and more uh, the, 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 um, the space is a little bit wider and people can, 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 can give up their, give their opinion. Uh, the press uh, is more uh, ready to be a, uh, a free press, but there's still uh, the known restrictions, and I question myself sometimes, is this uh, really still needed in Singapore? Is not, uh, not the common sense of the citizens as far developed that this uh, works uh, by, by, by itself, or perhaps uh, um, and, 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 and the country would, would, take, uh, would take even advantage out of that. Um, concerning, uh, yeah, this is, I think, your second question, then if in Switzerland how we can maintain our, uh, the system even with uh, more internationalization. Yes, this is a challenge, but um, I mean, I see it. My wife, for example, she's Italian origin and she uh, very much interested in in voting and so on. They don't have this in the same way in Italy, even it's a democratic country. So she learned about it and now she, she adapted. And I think we also make, a, like Singapore, make a case out of it that somebody wants to become a Swiss and has then the right to be a citizen and voting. He has to be integrated. He has to know some of our languages. He has to know about Switzerland. So this is not a guarantee, but also for Swiss, sometimes we don't know exactly. It's, a, it's a quite a complicated process. And we are becoming also a much more multicultural society, but that's not only uh, Singapore it is. This is, has also a lot of advantages and also not only negative things. But I agree also there is population in Switzerland, perhaps more to conservative people, they see this as a, as a, a risk. We lose our identity. And the question is, what is an identity of Swiss today? What's the identity of a Singaporean? I mean, I think in Singapore, this was very interesting over the last 52 years, and you know better than me. This is a success that today, most of you probably, when you would be asked, uh, who are you? You wouldn't say anymore, I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, in Chinese uh, background. So you say, yeah, I'm a Singaporean. And then secondly, you say, eventually, uh, you come with your ethnic history which is also a good thing. In Switzerland, a little bit the same. In Switzerland, we have even the cantonal, the regional uh, um, um, relation, which, 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 which is also important. 
But uh, uh, perhaps it would be interesting, we have uh, another Swiss here from my embassy, uh, Sarah, she's a young staff at the embassy, a trainee. So what do you, what do you think, if I may ask you to ask, what is uh, today the challenge for young, young Swiss people? Yeah, what is, what is how young Swiss people see this multicultural uh, 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 development? And I guess, are yourself a little bit multicultural, so I guess you see it very positive. Mm. Um. Stand up, please. Well, uh, Stand up, please. Oh, yes, yes um, good evening, everyone. So I agree with the ambassador, a bit like Singaporeans here. When you ask a Swiss person, you know, where are you from, they'll first say, oh, I'm Swiss. And then, if prompted, we'll say, oh, I'm from the French-speaking part, or I'm from the German-speaking part. But I think just like Singaporeans, we have a kind of strong national identity. We are all Swiss. Um, and when it comes to for me personally, or for my generation, is multi multiculturalism a good thing? Um, yes, I think so. Um, I've lived in four or five countries now, and I think that I've learned a lot from looking at different political systems and different cultures. And I really think that when different thoughts and when different cultures come together, they they are more than you know the sum of what they are at the beginning. So. Um, I think that I agree with the ambassador. Switzerland has really benefited from all of this multiculturalism. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Obviously, she has to agree with the ambassador. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she, knows, she knows also Japanese very well. Uh, okay. um, Your Excellency, my name is Donald White, and um, I've worked with uh, Swiss international organizations in Switzerland, both in uh, Geneva and in Zurich. Well, the question I'm going to ask, I'll put to you is, um, I've visited uh, Switzerland a number of occasions, and uh, there's one thing that still um, uh, interests me in that um, we, in Singapore, I've also worked for the SAF in Singapore, um, is that we adopted the national service system that uh, you have in Switzerland. Um, of course, it's been um, the Israeli influence also is there. But um, the way I understand it is that uh, Switzerland has not been engaged in war in the last 400 years. And that must be something, if I'm correct. All right? And uh, that must be something really fantastic. But um, I've, um, one evening as I was returning home, and I was in the railway station, and there I saw this young national service boy um, and he must be reporting back to camp, his family with him. But you know something, he was carrying his rifle with him. So I asked him, I inquired around and he said, oh yes, oh, over in, in, in Switzerland you can take your rifle home. So <laughs> I don't know whether, uh, I mean, th th that's the, the amount of confidence you'll have. But what is the attitude today of the young people in Switzerland uh, having to serve national service? Thank you. Uh, th thank you for this question. Um, as I said, there is a parallelism because we, you built the system after our, our model, um, compulsory service, uh, and um, reserves, and also civil protection, and all these uh, things. And also a little bit the idea, a small country has to defend itself against big neighbors. Uh, this basically is still true, uh, but the, re and, uh, the reality today is a little bit different uh, through developments in Switzerland and Europe and also through um, perhaps the general trend in, in, in Europe. Um, and we saw this uh, just about three weeks ago. My defense minister was here at the Shangri-La Dialogue and the day after he, we had a bilateral visit with Singapore minister and then we, he was invited with the delegation to visit um, Tekong Palau island where all the young Singaporeans start their military service. That was quite interesting. Reality today is quite different in the two countries in the sense that uh, in Singapore the acceptance and the, um, the, the push for uh, making military service acceptance and reality is still very high. I mean it's about 96 percent of all Singaporean young men do the military service. Uh, some who are really uh, not fit at all, they do, I learned this, uh, fitness training for 10 weeks before they can do the military service or state fitness uh, training uh, for free. Uh, and even people who are perhaps have some back problems or whatever problems, they still do some kind of military service. 
also, uh, the finances for in Singapore is still unquestioned. I mean, there's no debate on how much you you spend for the military. Uh, if if uh, planes cost so much, and the military and political leadership is of the opinion that this is needed to have a strong army and strong air force, you're ready for pay for that. And I think population follows largely. It's not a big discussion on it. Uh, in Switzerland, this has a developed quite differently. Through our, this is a, a, a result of our political system. Today you can make a referendum. We had once a 20 years ago a referendum by the left, extra left. Do you want, we, we proposing to abolish the army. This was rejected, obviously. Uh, but then we had, for example, another vote uh, three years ago where Swiss government parliament have already decided to take a, a new fighter plane, the, the Gripen from Sweden. It was a very long process. And then uh, some people didn't like it, and there was a vote on it, and it was rejected. So no new planes. So not so easy for the defense minister. So this is a little bit part of our democratic system, but it shows that um, can sometimes become a little bit difficult. But at the end, it works well. It just sometimes delays the process. Now, on the, in the population itself, uh, there is uh, uh, perhaps a little bit less enthusiasm today by the young people to the military. Uh, we also reformed our military, our armed forces dramatically. We went from 600,000 staff, not uh, full-time, obviously, in the reserves. We have no, uh, we have very little professional military. Almost everybody is militia. But we had 600,000 still about 40 years ago. We reduced to 400,000. We are now 200,000, and we will go to 100,000. Because we ref think this reflects the modern way of uh, warfare, we have to be highly equipped and no need to have that many people around. And the, er, the, the part which is in Singapore also very important is to make young men good citizens and bring them for, four, uh, for um, one and a half years into the army to train them and to make them responsible citizens. This is still important in Switzerland but has lost a little bit of, of its uh, import, uh, of the, yeah, it's less important. Um, so. As a result, we have about, even if it's compulsory, we have about only 65% of our young men really doing the military service. So the real, the reality is a little bit today different between Singapore and Switzerland, uh, but the general system is similar. And it's true, we are lucky we didn't have the military uh, war, a military uh, conflict for many, many years. We had the last domestic conflict, which was kind of a little civil war, but very short. I think it uh, went less than a week. Uh, uh, between the Cat Catholics and the Protestant in 1847, so 100, almost 180 years ago. So uh, the Swiss military is a very special thing, uh, uh, and people are still proud of our military, but it has lost a little bit of the actuality. Also because we have in Europe today a relatively peaceful setup with the European Union, a war between Germany and France and Italy and Poland and the UK is not imaginable anymore. I mean, you never know, but it's not imaginable. And even Brexit takes place, it isn't impossible. We had a war in Europe in Yugoslavia, the last one, and it was quite a cruel war. But this was at the periphery of Europe. It touched us a lot because we have many Yugoslavian people in Switzerland. But core Europe, through the European Union, a war is almost impossible, fortunately. Hi, um, good evening, um, Your Excellency. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, my first question is regarding the environment. Um, I think in Singapore, we are slowly growing more conscious of the environment. We want to protect the environment, but I think we still have some way to go. Um, how is it like in Switzerland? Do we have anything to learn, Singaporeans learn from the Swiss, or do the Swiss have anything to learn from us? Um, my second question is, your, in your portfolio, you have been ambassador to many different countries. What do you think Switzerland or Singapore can learn from these countries? Uh, the other countries that you have been an ambassador to. Yes, thank you. Um, no, your first country environment, glad you touched this because that's, uh, I mentioned climate change on, on the, in the margin. But obviously this is very important. I think in Switzerland we have uh, become very consciously on the environment over the last 30, 40 years. We have a beautiful country and we know that uh, preserving our country 
our, but the others, their country is very important. Um, once our glacier will, would melt away, uh, we lose a lot of uh, Swissness and so on. So I think it is important, so people are conscious. There was in Switzerland, for example, strong movement against uh, nuclear. Uh, we are quite, uh, our energy is 35% uh, atomic, but after uh, the Japanese accident, uh, there was some uh, uh, weariness and uh, government has basically decided to get out of new atom uh, energy over the next 20, 20 years. Population is quite conscious on on on, on these things. Uh, you see, I can give you the example. I mean, in Switzerland, we have today many people who don't drive a car anymore, and they go by train, which we are excellent in Switzerland, or when they can on the small short run on bicycle. And really, by decision that it's not needed a car, it's uh, expensive, but it's particularly it's not good for the environment, and they can afford the car. I would make a bet today in, in Singapore, all the persons who cannot uh, come not with a car, it's basically because it's just expensive. In, in Singapore, there's not yet the consciousness to not drive a car because uh, you make a contribution to the environment. So it's still, as you say, a long way to go. You start it also later, but there is many things. Of, I mean, environment protection starts at home with a separate, uh, um, yeah, this one. And then, uh, as I say, perhaps not driving the car if it's not needed and so on. So I think it's very good that Singapore uh, uh, um, pushes very strongly the public uh, transport. It's good for social reason, for giving the people who have not a car the best possible uh, connections. And uh, because in Singapore it's also not so nice to walk too far outside with the seat. But also for giving, uh, making a contribution to environment. So I think there is... There is on, on the whole, on the big issues, Singapore is uh, supporting the climate change deal. The, the diplomats were active in Paris. It is a little bit strange that Singapore puts itself in the, I have to say this because uh, it's, uh, I, t I told this also to the environment minister. It is uh, difficult to understand how Singapore puts himself in the category of developing countries in the Paris uh, declaration. But, um, this is, uh, nobody could yet explain me that, why this happened, but uh, I always think that Singapore is quite developed. But uh, this is a little bit a special topic. Now concerning other countries, I believe every country can learn from others. The countries I have served as an ambassador were quite different. I mean, my last one, Korea, is not that different than Singapore in the sense it's Asia, different Asia, it's a more industry Asia, here's more service, uh, financial Asia, but there is also Confucius thinking. And I was, uh, I was uh, glad when I, I had learned already about Asia in, in, uh, in Korea and come, co could come to Singapore. The major difference, and the uh, ones who know Korea know it well, Korea is one of the most homogeneous country. Everybody is Korean, they think Korean, they eat Korean, and they, 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 they speak Korean. And Singapore, in this sense, is the country. It's a melting pot uh, with the, makes it much easier also for us foreigners because we can speak the English, but that's, uh, I could have learned the Korean. I mean, that was my, my mistake. <laughs> but I could not do it. Sometimes when, uh, just as a, as a, as a little uh, story, when uh, sometimes people were uh, um, making compliments and saying, yes, you can say, speak so many languages, then I said, okay, you can have the five languages, I give it to you, and you give me the Korean. But when I leave Korean for years, you give me back my languages and I give you back the Korean. It didn't work so, but uh, Korea is a, is, a, is a country with huge successes. It has also developed to a quite a good democracy, even if they had some problems uh, over the last year. But this was also good governance at the end to challenge the, the, the bad governance. And uh, I have a lot of respect for Korea, having done this in a very difficult international framework with these crazy guys, uh, dangerous persons in the north. So, um, so I think they did, they did quite well. Colombia is a ho totally another story. It's in Latin America. It's a country uh, which has suffered over the last 50 years uh, through a guerrilla war, which was one of the most bloody ones in the world. Uh, now finally, they have finally come to the end of that, which is good for the country because too much suffering. And it will give the, chance, the country a chance to develop um, even more, it's because it's quite good economy there and very 
very good perspectives. I'm a big fan of Colombia and uh, uh, perhaps interesting what I can say, what we can learn perhaps is that Colombia, despite all these difficulties in this uh, international rankings about happiness, they were often number one or number two. And Singapore and Switzerland, I mean, there are some, there are some standards on uh, rankings on happiness which uh, say, they say, are oh, you happy to live in this country? But then it's the, they try to find out how we are really are, how, what, what makes happiness really, how we feel in the morning. And there, importantly, Switzerland and Singapore are quite low. So I think we can learn from, uh, from for example, Colombia and probably from many African countries how, uh, how you can live happy and how you can, I should say this also to myself, I mean, it's a really a, a challenge for life. To, to, to from these countries. So I think uh, I was uh, blessed to have different countries, to have uh, lived in different areas, know a little bit the world, and uh, come now to Singapore, where it's a little bit, many of all these things come here together. Right. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take that as the last question, but maybe from me a question for uh, to the ambassador. You've been staying in Singapore for quite a while. Have you picked up some Singlish? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can I can understand and, uh, um, and my my staff at the embassy we have quite many uh, Singaporean staff Chinese or Malay uh, and uh, when they speak among each other I can manage to understand um, but uh, it is a it is a challenge I can also eat some of the Singaporean specialities I know your big love for food in Singapore um, when I um, knew that I would come into Singapore. I got from my Singaporean colleague in Korea a five-page list of restaurants and food <laughs> and hawker, hawker centers which I should visit. I couldn't manage to do all, but you have to, as a, as a diplomat or when you live in another country, to try to get into the, into the culture of the other country. And I, I, we try to do this at its best. And it's a pleasure to be here in Singapore. Right. Thank, Thank you, Thank you for the answer, sir. Right, let's give a round of applause to the ambassador for answering all the questions. Pass the time over. We would like to invite uh, Mr. Eddie Lee to present a token of appreciation to His Excellency. Can I also invite the MC members on stage for a group photo? Can I also invite the MC members to take a group photo? Ladies and gentlemen, can we have another round of applause for His Excellency Thomas Stoffer? Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and you have a good evening. Good night.